I'll take only say I'll review for probably last time so I'm telling you myself. Or the Sunnah Alhamdulillah Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 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 Rasulullah Sallallahu Al
and you just see that entire movement from the school bathroom policies to the Congress and Senate, how did they have such a political success? Despite of the fact, if you see their morality, it's completely against most of the Semitic religions. How did they have such a political success? This is a separate topic, but they were working as a movement. Movement, not as an individual. When you work as an individual, as a minority, you will be slow. When you become part of any movement, all the movers and shakers are working for one cause, then the result will be quick and maybe an exponential growth. Okay, let's start with this coalition. Around 1980s, around 1980s, the L and G, I'm just using first letters. I'm pretty sure all of you know this, L and G, right? L and G, they were actually rivals. You know this, they were rivals. L thought that G is getting a male privilege in the workplace. They don't have to come in cosmetics and makeup to get the promotion and raises in the workplace, while L have to take care of their entire femininity to get promotion and raises. So they always label G as, oh, it's a patriarchal, tyrannical society, you are getting raises, you don't have to do that much to get the promotion if your boss or your supervisor is a female, but we have to do so many, so many things. They, when they were rivals, what brought them together? Do you know what brought, um, uh, just go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. Some of these slides uh, I don't want kids to see. Yeah, that's, that, that, can you, can you, oh, yeah, that's it, that's, that's it. We'll didn't discuss it, inshallah, okay. Um, what brought L and G together? Any idea? Yes. Yes. That, but you're talking about administrative, <laughs> I'm talking about what, made them forced to make that coalition of a stone wall. There was a reason, there was a medical reason why they came up with this stone wall thing. And that was AIDS crisis, AIDS crisis. Around 1980s, AIDS crisis came, and now you have the impression of the G, G I'm just using G, from the middle class privileged men, now they are being attacked because this disease is closely connected to their identity. Now, L and G, from being rival, they came up with a coalition against heterosexual people. Are you following, brothers and sisters? Remember the last time we were discussing about the entire worldview of majority, minority, oppressor, oppressed? So now, they realize that against heterosexual, like all of us, now L and G make a coalition and they started educating workshops against AIDS awareness and so forth because that's coming from the identity closely connected to the G. Interestingly, before we can move forward, G says, okay, if you ask any G or L, and if you ask them how many genders are there, what they will say, two or more than two? Two. G will say two. There are two genders, we are attracted to one, not to other. So, Okay, L, how many genders? Two. We are attracted to one, not to other. Bring B also in this coalition. B, bi. They will also say genders are two. We are attracted to both, they would say. You might think that among this coalition of L and G and B, which worked almost for 10 to 15 years from 1980s, their worst enemy will be someone or a group who will say that genders are not two. You will think that the worst enemy of L and G and B will be the group who says genders are not binary because it removes the foundation of their coalition. And that group was, that group was T. It's very surprising how T joined this coalition. Isn't it interesting? T just denies the foundation that no, genders are not two. Gender is a social construct and then eventually that discussion will come. And then Q also rejects the idea of genders are two. It also joined this coalition. 
and then goes on and goes on and now we have more than 100 plus identities. I don't even know, subhanAllah, uh, more than just a <laughs> dozen. I know, but subhanAllah. Wallahu al-musta'an wa alayhi tuklan wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al-aliyya al-azim. Let's come back. Now you know about L, G, B, T and Q join, which is very, very problematic because it doesn't resonate with their foundation. Little bit about T also before we can start this discussion. Because obviously nowadays the problem is we see them as together, but they are divided. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says actually in the Quran, Tahsabuhum jami'an wa qulubuhum shatta. This ayah was not revealed for LGBTQ. This ayah was revealed for Jews. There are three Jewish tribes in Medina. And Allah, uh, Allah is saying to Muslim community and Rasulullah that you will see them that they are together. They are Jewish community, but their hearts are divided. If you see them, L and G had issues. Even when T came, the G community and the L community had a hard time in digesting how can they come and join our coalition. Even the feminists were divided half and half. We'll discuss it next time, how the feminists and transgender are connected together. Now, how the T came. For more details, you can read two books. One, obviously, apart from this book. <laughs> Um, one book is a Strange New World by Carl Truman, and the other is coming, it's not being launched, it, it will be coming in July, um, Lost in the Trans Nation by Miriam, William, Miriam Grossman. Miriam Grossman, um, she is a psychotherapist, and she exposed this entire trans identity. But anyway, how did it come? She gave a podcast, if you ask, I can send you a link, I will just give you summary how trans ideology came. And you will see the entire hoax of it. SubhanAllah, that's the reason why I'm saying. There was a person called John Money. There's a person called John Money. He was a professor, doctor in John Hopkins. And around 1950s, 60s, he did his PhD in hermaphrodites, intersex. In Islam, do we have some term for them? Hermaphrodites? Khunsa. And then you have an entire discourse, by the way. There's Khunsa, there is Mushkil Khunsa, Ghair Mushkil Khunsa, Al Mukhannas. There is an entire discourse for it. I actually brought it at the end of my book about that entire, the summary of the entire discourse. So, around 1975, there was twin brothers who were born to a middle class family. One of the twin named was Bruce. Bruce. The parents took them both to circum for circumcision and the machine was not set properly, mechanical issue and it just took the entire genitalia instead of that one tissue while circumcising a child. Now these parents, like obviously they were non-Muslim, for them it's like what we'll do with our kids. And especially with Bruce, what, what we'll do with this. And so they were looking for solution for this issue, what can be done, he's still young. And they found on marketing, radio, that there is a person in John Hopkins, John Money, Dr. John Money, and he is coming with this theory that a gender is a social construct. Before the age of three, John Money wanted to prove, before the age of three, it is possible to change the gender. And obviously then the parents saw that, okay, there is a hope. They went to John Money, and obviously he made a lot of money with, <laughs> uh, with this couple. So he, and then there is an entire story that how he first of all exploited this uh, parents, and at the same time, he used for proving a fake ideology called gender ideology. So he said that actually it is possible to remove the entire remaining genitalia, including testicles, and to put a mechanical kind of a female genitalia. And then he asked the parents that now from Bruce, she will become Brenda. And do not inform him, or now inform her if you are just affirming the pronouns, although we should not affirm the pronoun, but do not inform this individual that this ever happened. Just try to train him like a female child. And then obviously there is an entire story that even though they didn't inform in the beginning, but Brenda was a tomboy kind of an individual. Because obviously how can you change? Later on, every year they would visit just to see how the things goes. And then later on actually they found out that Brenda was even sexually abused by John Money. That's a different story. When he became a teenager and then he became an adult, Brenda became an adult, eventually this news broke out and he found out, or she found out, Brenda found out, that now 
Uh, this entire thing was a hoax. Now there are two different things going on. One in the life of Bruce or Brenda, and one in the life of John Money. John Money is writing a research on this, at how successful my surgery is. So he's basically proposing a thesis or a dissertation that you can all change your genders, and gender is a social construct, and mechanically we can change it. And he's basing his research on this incident. And you know how this incident ended? Bruce actually realized this was a, Brenda realized this was a hoax. She became again David after realizing. So first it was Bruce, second, Brenda, irreversible damage. Now he came back to his original identity, but he named himself David. He adopted three kids. He worked as a janitor. He could not take any more. When he was 30-ish year old in 2004, he committed suicide. And this incident was used by John Money as he was successful story to change your gender. And then obviously there was other, other, other movements who added this. Uh, the point is that such an speculative sample and look at the definitive voice. So much is speculation, but see how they present their case. For more details, you can read the book, Miriam Grossman, Lost in the Trans World. But anyway, they joined this society, LGBTQ, and now it's a very uh, strong movement, which is impacting all of us and including especially us. Just recent development, the Gs are actually upset with the T. So much so that actually some of the Gs are siding with the conservatives that T are going so radical. <laughs> I'm just telling you, FYI. So this is, wallahu mustan, I don't know where it will end, but I'm just telling you how the LGBTQ coalition came. Okay, now, coming back to these slides, inshallah ta'ala. Remember last time we discussed introduction of Islam, modernity, and postmodernity? Who will give me the summary of what is postmodernity? Just quickly, what is postmodernity? Yes? No reason, no revelation. Absolutely, everything is just how you feel, subjective, speculative, and everything is so equally speculative that it cannot be imposed on others. So it's very weird. It's like everyone have their plastic and it will melt. Um, now let's come to three basic difference between Islam and all these isms. Whether you take postmodernism, neo-Marxism, modernism as a philosophy, liberalism, conservatism, libertarianism, feminism, whatever you take, ism. It's very difficult for a person to study all of them as a normal person. We don't even study Quran. Just forget about these uh, complex, complicated issues of philosophy, right? So what we can do right now, just to focus on three things, three basic difference. And this is coming from three different scholars. One is my teacher, Dr. Sar Ahmed. Uh, rahimahullah. Second is by Sheikh Abdul Aziz Tarifi for Rajallahu An. Um, he is in the prison. Make dua for him. There may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala release him. Um, and um, a third is um, Sheikh Ibrahim Sukran. Um, these three difference. If you will understand these three difference, you will be able to identify what, how Islam sees the world and how these isms see the world. I hope you could remember the conversation of last time, around a few centuries ago when the clash happened between the churches and then they said, okay, everything should be based on reason. You remember that conversation, right? Okay, alhamdulillah. So let's start. We Muslims, we want to cross the bridge of modernity without losing our religion. Yes or no? But European precedent is making me anxious. Because while crossing the bridge of modernity, they lost their religion. Now, there are a few people who would say, no, no, don't cross the bridge of modernity. Okay, then make an Amish. Do you know Amish community in America? Just Google it. But you won't be productive. La rahbaniyat of Islam, la sarurat of Islam, kama qala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is no monasticism in Islam. So I have to cross the bridge, but I want to preserve my traditional religion. I don't want to lose that. Crossing the bridge of modernity, that's a very good, that's a, that there were some com movements and communities who didn't cross the bridge in this Muslim community, but eventually they realized it, flood came and took them away. So we have to 
respond to the challenges of modernity. If it's technological challenge, you have to accept. Philosophical or social sciences challenge, we don't have to. We have to make it Sharia compliant before accepting it while crossing the bridge in a way that we are not living the path of uh, monasticism or Rahbaniya. Okay, now let's, um, le let's realize. Now you have to understand, most of these isms, liberalism, it came when Europe denied God, right? Conservatism, you will be surprised. It actually came after the post-enlightenment era, conservatism. It also came, just focus on reason, no to revelation. Same, same thing for libertarianism, all these isms, what we are, what is known today, and neo-Marxism is very new, post-Marxism is very new. One thing is very common, when you see the world around you, Netflix, Hollywood, Bollywood, I'm sorry I'm giving these examples, but this, we, all, we all are exposed to this society, internet, you go to school, social sciences, humanities, economics, senate, congress, politics, including sexuality, which worldview is being more obvious? Is it Islamic worldview or this ism worldview? This modern and postmodern worldview, right? So it's very important for me, if I have to live in this society, if I have to raise my kids in this society, I have to know the difference. If my kids are going into the college, whether they are becoming medical doctor, engineer, in economics, or especially in social sciences and psychology or philosophy, they have to know the difference. They have to know the difference. How many times in our, how many of you are taking medicine, or medical, uh, medical field in college? You can raise your hand. No doctors? Okay, alhamdulillah. In your college, you will examine the entire human body, but you will see rarely the discussion of God is a cre as a creator of the body. Because that is removed from the discourse for three, four hundred years. For us, should we have medical doctors in a Muslim community? Yes. But we have a different idea about medical body. That there is a creator of the body. There is a sustainer of that body. And yes, we have to believe in this materialistic source, but there is a soul also. So that entire thing actually have a different discourse. We see things from a different perspective. So that's why this is important to understand these three worldviews. And then we'll come back to uh, the entire uh, transgen transgender and LGBTQ argument, inshallah. Okay, let's go one by one, inshallah. What's the difference between Islam and modernity or postmodernity? When I say modernity, I include every ism. Just have fire. It's easy to use one word. First difference is that all these isms, modernity and postmodernity, do they believe in body or soul? Materialism, madda, body. Just rule of thumb, they don't believe in any unseen thing. Just rule of thumb. Rule of thumb, they don't believe in any ghaib, any unseen thing. Why they don't believe in any unseen thing? Any idea? They will have a hard time in believing in unseen thing. Why? Hmm? Absolutely, and they believe, they first of all remove the God from the history, we know this, from the Europe. Secondly, anything which cannot be proven from the empirical sciences or from the physical sciences, they would say, no, it's very doubtful. Scientific community put a question mark, philosophical community will going to deny it, and they will say, just focus on something what we can see, not what we cannot see. And because the unseen world was abused, in Christianity, just remember this, everyone was talking about metaphysics and they were killing each other. Remember that history? Catholics were killing Protestants using the same metaphysical world. So this, uh, this is too dangerous, man. <laughs> just focus on physical body. So unseen world, first reason is because it cannot be observed. And second, it just denies the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. So they believe in materialism, they believe in body, but they don't believe in soul. When you come to Islam, in Islam, do we believe in materialism and body? Does our body exist in Islam? Absolutely. We believe in body. But do we believe in soul? Ruh? Absolutely. Both are important, but which one is more important? Soul is more important. Body will die, but soul will go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You remember that? The entire Surah Al-Fajr ending. Okay. Now what we learn from this difference, the denial of soul, what, what we are learning from this. First, first, soul is from the unseen world, so it's easy to deny. Second, second, when you are saying 
that we don't have soul, it means soul comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we Muslim believe, right? It just disconnects your relationship with higher authority. Once you deny the soul, it just disconnects your relationship with higher authority. When, once it disconnects your relationship with the higher authority, the entire focus is on soul or on the body? Body. Now soul is really removed. Okay, we as a Muslim, we believe that we as a human body, as a human body, I need to eat something or drink something to fulfill my physical desire, otherwise my body will die. My soul, which have the introduction from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alastu bi rabbiqum, and the same soul was blown into the womb of my mother when I came out, have the introduction to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that soul will going to remind my body, eat halal, do not eat haram. Body in and of itself doesn't know what is halal and haram. Body just want to grab something and eat. Soul will remind it. Now body have some other desires also. Not only physical desire. That desire. Now does body know that this desire is beneficial or harmful for the body? No. But this body is programmed in that whether it have the desire. Who knows that it's beneficial or harmful? Allah and Allah put that in my soul and gave me guidance to recognize. When I deny the soul, then what becomes the purpose of my life? Tell me. My body and bodily desires. Because I deny the soul, I deny soul coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then how I will fulfill those desires will be the purpose of my life. There's a term in philosophy, again I'm not torturing you with philosophy, I promise, called nihilism. How many of you have heard that? This meaningless life. Meaningless life. Just, just Google it once you go home, nihilism. That is coming from this entire idea. You deny the soul, you deny the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hence now the focus is not on soul, the focus is on your bodily desires. That's the second thing. Third thing we are learning from this division, body versus soul. Once you deny the soul and connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will end up saying, who is the owner of the body? Tell me. Previously you say, soul comes from Allah. I have to be bound with the restriction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have to submit my choice and my freedom and my feeling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have removed this entire idea out of the window. And now the entire focus is body. The entire focus is materialism. So now, who is the owner of the body? My body, my choice. That entire argument will come. I will do with my body whatever I want. And any outside institution, including religion, if they were going to tell me to stop, I will see them as a threat. Because you are coming into my ownership. And that's why, that's why it's sad that some therapists, not some, most of the therapists will see those parents with a demonizing attitude who will not confirm their kid's feeling for the transgender surgeries. Because kids have their own option, they have their own body, let them make decision. Oh, but for other things, they have to wait until 18 and 21. But for this, they can make decision. And parents have no right to come in this. I'll tell you something in a very conservative language. How, how many of you know Sigmund Freud? Raise your hand. He's called as father of psychologists. Okay. He had, a, he had a student or the person who basically took his legacy, Wilhelm Reich. Wilhelm Reich. Read his book, he, I cannot even name his book because of some obscene words. But anyway, he wrote in his book that we should punish those parents, he's writing, we should punish those parents who are saying no to their kids to fulfill their those desires. I'm using very conservative language. We should discipline those parents. So now you know where this entire civilization is coming from, where this entire movement is coming from. For the entire statement, you can read my book, um, but I cannot say because of the um, some, some diverse audience. Okay, anyway. So this is materialism versus soul, or body versus soul. Is that clear? That's the first difference. So when you are studying medicine, where the entire focus will be? Materialism body, not on soul. When you are looking at Netflix, the entire focus will be to nourish the soul or to fulfill the bodily desires. Remember this. Successful person is a person whose soul is successful or materialistically he's successful or she's successful? 
How success will be defined, materialistically or through nourishing the soul? Now you know where the people, now entire YouTube videos about how to become successful, now it will make sense why they are coming from this paradigm. Entire world around you is talking from only materialistic source, not from the soul sense. This should give you some fruit of thought when you go home to think about that I was being indoctrinated, I was being fooled by this Western civilization and by this global, global entire society because of the cultural imperialism. So I should basically just delete and shift delete some of the thoughts which I have gained from my school and from my academia and make my thoughts Sharia compliant. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us up tawfiq and sadat. Ameen ya Rabb. This is too much detail we are going. Let me see how much time we have. Subhanallah. <laughs> I was like planning to finish this in the end. By the end of June, it looks very difficult. But I hope we can finish this slide today, inshallah. Um, Isha is at 10.15, right? It will finish around 10, Q&A, and then Azan, and then inshallah. Uh, second thing, second thing. Second difference between Islam and all these modernisms or postmodernity or neo marxist Second difference that Islam, uh, first of all, modernity or this, all these isms will going to see the world, this world and this universe and this gal galaxies. But do they believe in Akhirah, hereafter? No. Why? Because it's from the unseen. Jannah is from the seen or unseen? Hell is from the seen or unseen? But this is not the only reason why modernity and postmodernity denies Akhirah. There's one more reason. Yes. When you remove Akhirah, it just removes the sense of accountability. It removes the sense of accountability. I can be myself without thinking of the consequences. Have you ever heard, be yourself? <laughs> I'll tell you something funny. In Islam, you don't be yourself. In Islam, you just need to improve yourself. <laughs> this entire idea of be yourself, read my book, came from Jack Russo, um, who, who, subhanAllah, will take me to a tangent. Um, but most of the motivational speakers uses him, but they don't know where they are coming from. Um, but anyway, uh, you can read my book for more details or maybe some other time, maybe third or fourth session, we'll go into his life detail. Anyway, so this dunya versus akhirah. Modernity, postmodernity, these isms believe in this dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Islam, do we believe in this dunya? Absolutely. But do we believe in akhirah? Okay. Both are important, but in comparison, which one is more important? In terms of akhirah, dunya is worthless. But yes, dunya is important. By the way, before I can, I forgot to tell you one thing from body and soul. Just please, uh, give me a minute. Islam gives you a best synthesis of the two extremes of thesis and antithesis. Do you believe that? There's thesis, one extreme. There's antithesis, another extreme. And then comes synthesis in the middle. In the body versus soul, there are few people in this world who have made the bodily desires, because they deny the soul, modernists, they made the bodily desires their god, their idol. They have idolized. In philosophy terms, we call them hedonism. Hedonism, hedonism is when you just basically idolize the, those desires. It comes from Christianity Catholicism, because in Catholicism, if you want to become priest, if you want to become pastor, good number of even denominations today, they would say, you should not get married, right? Because they would say, nourish your soul, don't nourish your bodily desire. And then on the other extreme, this modernists say, no, 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 forget about the soul, just focus on your bodily desire. So hedonism and monasticism, idolizing those desires, demonizing those desires. Islam comes and balances those two, subhanAllah. Islam says, nourish the soul, but fulfill those bodily desires in a way pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Akbar. Now come to the body, uh, come to the uh, uh, this dunya and akhirah also. Islam provides beautiful synthesis. Beautiful synthesis. So you have, in Islam, we believe in dunya, we believe in akhirah, but we believe in a synthesis. We don't believe in monasticism that leave the dunya and go in the corner and don't engage in dunya. Rasulullah says, La rahbaniya ta fil Islam. There is no rahbaniya fil Islam. La sarura ta fil Islam. There is no monasticism in Islam. You have to engage in the world. You have to engage in the society. And then you have to bring a proper change. And while doing this, you have to focus on akhirah.
not in dunya. This is very different than the Catholic worldview, where this is a sort of forget the dunya or the monk kind of a concept. No, we don't have that in Islam. We don't have that in Islam. Okay, now very important thing. Now, if you go into the college, the college trends, okay, before the college, Senate and Congress, when they are making laws, when they are making laws, whether Republican or liberals, do they consider factors of dunya or akhirah when making the laws? They don't even, obviously, they don't believe in akhirah. They don't, why would they consider akhirah? When they are making gun laws, abortion laws, or a 14-year-old can have a gender reassignment surgery without the consent of the father or mother, all these laws, are they considering dunya or akhirah? The pain or pleasure of dunya or the pain or pleasure of akhirah? So no akhirah is key. And while we are living in this society, we get desynthesized. Our benchmark is started becoming more modern. I told you last time, when you are waking up your kids for Salatul Fajr, you wake them once and they will, your wife will say, oh no, let, let her sleep. And then after 30 minutes for a school, you might discipline them to wake them for the school because the school is important. And it is important, but Salah is important also. And Salah is more important, I would argue. But Salah is taking in a casual way because that is not your priority. Again, we are thinking from a modern perspective. We are becoming modernists because we are the byproduct of our time. So we need to basically um, basically to open those knots which uh, are uh, confusing us in our mind. And that is why, subhanAllah, I, would, I say this all the time, that the definition of successful and failure have changed in our time. Now, the definition of successful and failure in our time is a person, is a, su su successful is a person who is successful in the materialistic sense. In Akhirah, even if he goes to hell, but the dunya would see them, the world would see them right now as successful. And that have integrated into our communities also. Don't you think so? I usually give this example, uh, I give this example to somewhere, I don't know whether Vaim Richardson or some others that, um, if Firaun will be alive today, Firaun will be alive today, and if you have a YouTube channel with more than one billion following, Twitter one million follower, richer than Elon Musk, uh, bigger follower than Mark Zuckerberg or whatever, if Firaun comes today with his portfolio, killing thousands of babies, oppressor, tyrant, Ibn Taymiyyah says there is no worse person than Firaun, if he comes in the masjid, as a non-Muslim, as a tyrant, some of our Muslim youth with this background will going to go and ask Firon, Firon, can, can we take one selfie? And they'll post on Instagram, hey buddy, see I'm with Firon. Because our worldview is changed completely. We don't see things from the Akhira angle at all. We see things from the worldly angle. Successful in world, failure in world. And that's why we can drive insane conclusions in the Sharia. If that is the case, then Firaun was more successful than Musa, if you see world from this angle, from the materialistic angle. Bilal was lesser successful than Umayy ibn Khalf, if you'll see this, if you'll see the world from this angle. Umayy ibn Khalf was the former master of Bilal when Abu Bakr came and freed him. We all know this. So it's extremely important for us to see things from this Akhira angle the hereafter angle. Okay, these are the two things. Let's move to the um, final thing, and this is the heart of the entire topic. First is, first difference is materialism, body versus soul. Second is, dunya versus akhara, this world and the next. By the way, we don't believe that you should leave your dunya. Remember last time I said that out of 10 companions, six of them, were rich, who were giving glad tidings of Jannah in the Zuni Ashram of Ashra. You remember that I told you this last time, right? Or, or maybe I was talking in ICA, oh okay, God, here. So this is extremely important to go hard. We, we, we need, alhamdulillah, good people who have the money so that eventually they can give it back to community and we can become stronger in community. Uh, because what is our accumulated wealth in America? I'm sorry to say this. Even Muslims were minority in the times when Islam started, but subhanAllah see that that Abu Bakr and Uthman and Abdul Rahman ibn Auf and these great people were wealthy and that's how they supported. So we, we need that from a halal, from a halal perspective, from a Sharia compliant perspective. We don't believe in monasticism, as I said. But our focus should be Akhara. We, we should have wealth in the, our hands, not in our heart, as a Tuskia scholar said. Okay, now the final thing, final difference between Islam versus modernity or postmodernity. I would say this is more related to postmodernity. 
Modernists or postmodernists believe in human being, right? Believe in that I exist. But they don't believe in the existence of Allah. In Islam, do we believe that we exist? Ourselves, we exist? Absolutely. We differentiate between the khaliq and makhluk, creator and creation. But we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists and that is his existence. Other existence will be worthless when you compare to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once you deny the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what the modernists, what the modernists have done, you know this? Just, just tell me, once you deny the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what will be the consequences in practical life? What you can see right now? First, you will start worshipping yourself. So the worldview was Allah-centric, God-centric. You remove Allah, now the worldview will be self-centric. Now the worldview will be human-centric. Or honestly speaking, the worldview will be egocentric. Before we can move to the second consequence, what it does, you know this? Many things. First, I will going to be very selfish in my entire life. I will see every institution, whether institution of parenting, institution of family, institution of marriage, what I am getting from that institution because everything should serve me and my feelings. Because Allah is being removed. That's why subhanAllah, 11 years of experience of marriage counseling. And I can tell you number one reason, out of 10, 11 reasons, uh, we can give a separate talk on this. Number one reason from the psychological perspective is that husband and wife, they both are looking what I'm getting out of this marriage. They won't see what I'm giving in this marriage. Because once you believe in Allah, then you believe that actually we are part of one family. Now you removed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is just a symbolic thing. Then you will see what I'm getting from this marriage. I, me, myself, that will be the part of discussion. So that's the first thing. That's the first thing. Um, our worldview right now, is it parent-centered parent -centered worldview or child-centered worldview? Who will tell me? Child-centered child -centered. Most of the khutbas, have you ever heard a khutbah in Muslim majority countries? How many of you are from Muslim majority countries? Tell me. Okay, how many of you have heard the khutbah there and you are not sleeping? Raise your hand. Okay. Have you ever heard the khutbah in Muslim majority countries about the parents' rights? Okay. When I, I went to the mothers in Pakistan and then even sometime in Saudi and others, I would listen, even when I was there, Sheikh Saud al shurim gave his final khutbah on the rights of the parents, uh, the very famous khutbah, subhanAllah. Um, they would focus a lot on being nice to parents, being good to the parents. Allah says five times, ihsana. Now we are not saying that exception cases are not there, that some parents are abusive, some parents are oppressive, but exception, not general rule, right? But when you will come into this child center parenting Western countries, Muslims will going to have a huge impact from the collective society. So now, most of our khutbas or workshop will be how, how to be a nice parents, how to, because now the entire focus is shifted to child. Now, we should be, con we should be concerned about the feelings of the child. Don't go to the other extreme. But who will going to mention the rights of the parents? If you see Quran, Quran is very explicit about that. And then when you are going to give khutbah of the rights of parents, then you will going to get feedback about, oh no, astaghfirullah, then some of my parents will abuse this khutbah. Dude, I was just quoting the ayah of the Quran, ihsana. Because our worldview is so child-centered, that now child or children do not want to obey anyone, including their parents. When the term obedience comes, because we are so egocentric of our worldview, we don't want to obey anyone. This is the problem when you remove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's the second problem? Once you remove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then will you need guidance from Him? You remove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why you need guidance? Third, if you don't need guidance, then it's basically revelation versus freedom. Absolute freedom. Absolute freedom. Then that entire garbage argument will come. Oh, we have freedom, we have choice. Means I have choice, I can do whatever I want without any consideration of God. I am free to make whatever decision I can without considering God. Now in Islam, we say you have freedom and choice within the limited circle what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have given to you. 
We don't say that you do not have freedom, but not outside of that. Now tell me one thing. If a sister is being asked, I know sister, I don't know, do they have mic? Asin, do they have mic? No worries, okay. If a sister is being asked, a sister, why are you wearing hijab? What will be their response? If their response is, I'm wearing hijab, my body, my choice. Is this argument right? No. The argument should be Sharia compliant because now you are playing in their territory. We don't believe in absolute choice. You submitted your choice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to get the happiness or the ultimate happiness. Now, do we believe in absolute freedom? First of all, how many of us here think that we have absolute freedom in America? Can you raise your hand? No one? America was building on freedom, man. That's what I heard from a history class. Yeah, you believe that, right? Okay. Okay. Okay, let, 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 let me then torture you for a while. Um, I, I know why you raised the hand. So, this entire idea that we have absolute freedom is absolute lie, deception. Why? I, I, I guess I gave this example last time. Um, uh, what's the speed limit here in, in, in Dallas, Richardson? 75 miles per hour? Okay, can you drive 130 miles per hour in Dallas? Tell me. First of all, if you have Honda Odyssey, you cannot. Don't even try this. But, but can you drive 130 miles per hour? I know some Muslims will say, oh, I'm a Muslim. I want to go to Jannah very quickly. Let me try this. But no, you cannot drive 130 miles per hour. You know why? Because the moment you will drive, the cop will come, pull you over. And if cop will ask you, why were you driving 130 miles per hour? What you will say? America was built on freedom. I have a freedom. I'm a free driver. I was feeling like a free driver. I was feeling like a fast driver. And I identify myself as a fast driver because of that feeling. If that cop is decent, he will only give you a ticket. Right? And he will say, Habibi, we need to restrict your feeling. We need to restrict your freedom. We need to restrict your choice so that you cannot harm yourself or harm others with unrestricted feeling. Agree? And he will give them a big ticket. <laughs> This is the entire idea. Who have absolute freedom? Even if you have Tesla, you have to drive within a speed limit, right? Someone might say, um, in the modern day argument, and I'm just coming into this um, uh, conclusion, inshallah ta'ala, that how do you bring that argument? This is for the car. You might physically harm someone. How about two people are doing something, in the case of LGBTQ, without using any provocative languages. In the case of LGBTQ, if two individuals are doing something, in private, without harming you, this is the argument, right? without harming, because they only think harm is physical harm, not metaphysical harm. Harming you, then what's the problem? No one is stopping you to pray in INT Masjid. Do you still have problem? And you say, yes, we still have problem. More argument will come next time because it's 10, but I'll just give you a few arguments. Do you believe, ask them, that infidelity is a problem? Yes. Then if I am married to someone and I am sleeping with someone else, with consent, won't it harm the society? It does, right? Do you know how many fatherless child are there in America? Any idea? Any idea? Rough idea. Last year's statistic. Any idea? Huh? Yeah, so I will give you exactly, in terms of 1.9 million kids, are fatherless. 80% of the male commit suicide, 20% of the female commit suicide, and out of those 80% male who are committing suicide, 60% are fatherless. You do, those two individuals will do something with consent, without harming, but they are harming the society. Why you don't see a harm, because you only see harm from the physical harm, not the long-term harm or the metaphysical harm. That's a problem. You don't see a societal harm because you believe in individualism. You don't believe in communism. Uh, is this a signal we should end? Okay, but inshallah this topic will continue just summarizing the entire discussion. Just summarizing the entire discussion. 
when you see the world around you, whether Netflix, if first of all, you should not see Netflix, but if you're looking at Netflix, Hollywood, Bollywood, filth of Hollywood, trash of Bollywood, or even the social sciences, economics, politics, humanities, philosophy, YouTube, YouTube shorts, TikTok, whatever filth you are watching, or whatever good things you are watching around you, you have to add these three things. You, when the body is discussed, you have to add the concept of soul. When dunya is discussed, you have to add the concept of akhirah factor. When every discussion is around you and yourself, you have to add the discussion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you are going to make that discourse as a halal discourse. I will actually end with this and we'll have a Q&A. I was teaching this to my kids, 9 and 11, in a very easy language. These three things. So next, uh, by the way, me and my kids, we see Dr. Binox all the time. Dr. B How many of you know, see Dr. Binox? Okay, Dr. Binox is this four or five minute clip, um, animation clip. Um, uh, they, they were going to pick one topic about the moon and about the sun, and they would tell the scientific uh, theories and facts. Um, so it's educational videos. So next day, after, after telling them that they don't believe in Allah, we believe in Allah, they don't believe in these things, next day, my kids and myself, we were looking at Dr. Binox, the benefits of these moon, benefits of the moon. So they were telling all the benefits of the moon from the scientific perspective. And at the end of the video, Dr. Binox said, so kids, we should be thankful to the moon. And Fatima, my daughter said, she's not here, so I can praise her because parents don't praise their kids, right? <laughs> so, so Fatima said, Abba, and he, she uses the word, how idiot Dr. Binox is, how can we be thankful to Allah, uh, to moon? We should be thankful to the creator of the moon. And then she said, see, they don't believe in who created the moon as you said, Abba, yesterday. And I said, now it resonates. Every one of you, when you now go back, see the news, see the world around you, try to add these three things, in those three things, and then you will see that everything will start making more sense to you, inshallah ta'ala. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us all wisdom, inshallah. Next time, we'll be discussing three paradigms, although we should have started today, but we are going slow. One paradigm is about gender identity. Um, can we move to the next slide just to show them? Uh, because they have very, um, if actually, if no one is there, just leave it. Um, no worries, no worries. Um, second paradigm is about sexuality, and third paradigm is about that one word which I'm not using it. Um, so next time we will be using a more open language.